So perhaps some of you have noticed uh, when you've come across chemical equations that uh, next to the formula or the chemical symbol for a uh, compound or an element, there is a, an odd looking little letter written in parentheses um, as kind of a subscript with that formula. Those are the states that the substance is in um, in the chemical reaction. It's important that we know the different states of matter that we can look at in chemical reactions. So we use four different states solids, liquids, gases, and aqueous. All aqueous means, guys, is dissolved in water. So when a substance is dissolved in water, we've taken a look at this before with acids, then that means it is aqueous. Okay. Other than that, solids, liquid, gases are what you have known them to be uh, basically throughout your whole lives uh, as you have studied matter. As I said previously, states are written in as a subscript in parentheses uh, to the right of the chemical formula. When we assign states, there is kind of a methodical way of going about and, and assigning states. It depends what type of substance you're looking at. So first of all, if we're taking a look at elements, elements are maybe one of the easier ones, uh, substances to assign states to, because all their states are given on the periodic table. So if you take a quick peek at your periodic table, you can see that um, the states of elements, we've got uh, mostly solids, we've got some gases found on the right-hand side of the periodic table, and then just two um, substances, bromine and mercury, are found as liquids at room temperature which I guess is something important to note as well. When we write the states for these, uh, these chemical substances, we're assuming uh, that we are under kind of standard room temperature types of, of conditions. Okay, That may not mean anything to you just yet, um, but perhaps in future, studying uh, chemistry in the future, that becomes more important. Moving on to take a look at molecular compounds. Reminder, molecular compounds are those made of two or more nonmetals. Okay, so the state will generally be given to you. Lots of times molecular compounds are gases. I don't expect you to necessarily know that all the time. Um, there are some substances that you will be expected to know, or at least, at the very least, it will make it a lot easier and quicker for you if you do know what they are. Um, so I have a list here of uh, several substances that you will need to know the states for. Let's quickly go through these. Carbon dioxide, I think most of us know is a gas. Water can generally is a liquid. And usually, guys, when we write that something is a liquid, we use a cursive L so it doesn't get confused with an I or something like that. Sometimes, though, and uh, more on this in our next lesson, sometimes, though, water will be a vapor. That generally happens in combustion reactions. Okay, so water will be a vapor in combustion reactions. I think almost every other time that I can think of, uh, water will be a liquid in your chemical reaction. Next, we have CH4, which is methane. Methane is a gas, and so is ammonia. A gas. Okay. H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide. We generally find that as a liquid. And then our last two uh, big compounds there, those are different kinds of sugars. So we've got glucose and we've got sucrose. Um, and those are both, as you might imagine, found as solids. So just a few things that you all will be expected to know. And again, Knowing this will make, um, make assigning states go a lot more quickly for you. So that's molecular compounds. So if we take a look at ionic compounds, they're generally solids at room temperature. Um, however, what we see, and we'll study this more in our future units when we talk about solutions more in depth, um, but what we usually see is that to um, dissolve a substance, an ionic substance in water, actually allows the reaction to be uh, carried out m more quickly, more effectively, and in some cases it allows it to be carried out at all. Usually when we mix two solids together, not a whole lot happens. And so when we can break down the crystal lattice 
structure of an ionic compound and free up the individual ions to react with each other, that can help us to uh, get a chemical reaction going there. So, when we're talking about solutions and when a reaction occurs in a solution, which for our purposes we will assume um, that double replacement reactions um, and single replacement reactions are definitely occurring in solution. Um, those two for sure, and I'm just trying to run through the other questions I've looked at. I, let's focus on those two uh, definitely will, be, will occur in solution. Now, when a, when a reaction occurs in solution, how do we know if that ionic compound is solid or aqueous? It has to do with the solubility of the ionic compound. If it is soluble, that means it will dissolve in water. If it is insoluble, it will not dissolve in water. Okay? Dissolving in water means it will form an aqueous solution. If it does not dissolve in water, it will just be a solid or if it's the product of a reactant, we would call that a precipitate. To determine solubility, we use the solubility table, which is on the back of your periodic table. Take a quick second, pull that out, turn it to the back side, and you'll see a table in about the middle of your periodic table that looks like this. Okay, hopefully you found it. Now, this table is set up into, um, into three rows. I want you to take a quick look um, at what's going on in each of those three rows. In our first row is where we find our anion. Remember, anion is the negatively charged ion in the, uh, found in the compound. After that, we've got one of two options. Okay, The compound can have high solubility, which means it will dissolve in water, which means it will form an aqueous solution. Or it could have low solubility, which means it will not dissolve in water, it's not soluble in water, it will be a solid. Either it's a solid to begin with, or if it's produced in a reaction, it is a precipitate. So how do we use this table? Okay, A few steps that you need to know. Make sure you jot these down. First thing that we want to do is we want to find our anion. Okay, we want to find our anion in this top row here. If you read across, there are a bunch of anions listed. The next thing we want to do is we want to determine if the cation falls into row uh, one or two. And I'm referring to these rows one and two here. Okay? That might be a little bit confusing. Let's do some examples. First example, in your notes, K2SO4. So I'm looking at an ionic compound here formed of a cation and an anion, which is which? Well, the anion has the negative charge. So in, in identifying that one, um, that is SO4, that's sulfate. Okay. So now I need to find sulfate in this top row of my solubility table, and I can see here is sulfate right here. <clears throat> when I take a look, most things... Uh, most cations, I should, should be specific here, most cations when with sulfate will form highly soluble or aqueous solutions. They will dissolve in water. Here are the exceptions listed. Okay, So, and if we stop and take a look, we can see the word most comes up for all of, um, all of these anions here. Oh, so how is this set up? Okay. Well, they'll tell you what most things do, what most cations do um, with this, with the anion. Okay, they will either most cations will um, help to form the highly soluble compounds, uh, and then the exceptions will be listed, and those will be insoluble compounds. Or, you know, in some cases we see the most 
most cations uh, with those anions will form uh, insoluble compounds. However, here are exceptions forming soluble compounds, okay? So back to our specific example, K2SO4. We've got um, most things with sulfate forming um, soluble or aqueous solutions. They're able to be dissolved in water. Okay, here are the exceptions, silver, lead 2, calcium, barium, strontium, radium. Well, what I didn't say was potassium. So potassium does not appear in this list of exceptions. So therefore, what I could assume here is that when I have potassium sulfate, okay, because potassium falls into this category of most, what I have is a highly soluble compound. Therefore, it would be able to be dissolved in water and it would form an aqueous solution. Next example. Oops. Na2CO3. Okay, Na2CO3. So first thing that we want to do here is we want to be able to find our anion. Okay, our anion in this compound is uh, that carbonate. So looking across the top row, I can see, oh, here's carbonate right there. Oh, it turns out most things with carbonate, most cations when they come with carbonate, they'll, that would make an insoluble compound. Let's take a look at the exceptions. The exceptions are cations found in group one and NH4. Well, sodium isn't NH4, but is sodium found in group one? Let's take a look, flip over uh, to the other side, to the periodic table side of our periodic table, and we can see that, yes, in fact, sodium is found in group one, okay? So here's an example where your cation falls in to the list of exceptions. Meaning, sodium carbonate will be a soluble compound, okay? It will dissolve in water. Our next example is calcium hydroxide. So the anion here is hydroxide, finding that in the solubility table. If we take a look, okay, most things with hydroxide, or yes, most things with hydroxide form uh, insoluble compounds. However, here are the list of um, exceptions for cations. So anything in group one, ammonium, strontium, barium, and I believe that's tellurium. I didn't say calcium. Let's double check, make sure calcium's not in group one. Nope, calcium's in group two. Okay, so that means calcium actually does fall into this most category. This time, the most category most things, when they are put with hydroxide, form uh, compounds with low solubility or insoluble compounds, meaning that this will not dissolve in water. It will be a solid. If you'd like to pause the video here and go through the next two examples on your own, that's great. Come back and check and see how you did. Okay, next example we have is copper 1 chloride. Now normally, copper, which is a multivalent metal, likes to be copper 2. In this particular case, it's copper 1. How do I know? Well, I know from the subscript that's on the anion. Chlorine, or chloride, in this compound has a subscript of 1, which isn't written. Okay, so I know that that must have come from the charge on copper, meaning that I'm dealing with copper 1 instead of copper 2. Finding chloride as my anion, there it is right there. Okay, most things, uh, most cations will form highly soluble compounds. Okay, here's the list of exceptions. Silver, lead, tellurium, um, some weird form of dimercury, 2 plus, mercury 1, and copper 1. So there's the exception right there. Copper 1, Okay, 
when it's with chloride, forms compounds that are insoluble or have low solubility and therefore will be a solid. Last example was iron 3 nitrate. Now if you pause the video earlier and you went to work through this, you might be returning to us to say, hey wait a second, there is no nitrate written on this table. If I go through all the anions, I can see the big listing here and no nitrate. Well, that's inconvenient, isn't it? No, it is not. Okay, I want to draw your attention to the fine print, the fine print here, which actually is a really, really helpful, helpful statement that will, um, that will help you guys to figure out the solubility um, of ionic compounds a lot more quickly. So it says, all ionic compounds containing group 1, ammonium, and nitrate ions have high solubility in water. So that means, ladies and gents, any time that I see a compound that contains a group 1 cation, or it contains ammonium, remember ammonium, this guy here, NH4+, okay, or it contains a nitrate, all of those compounds will be highly soluble in water, okay, their states will always be aqueous. So that's a really important shortcut um, that, will, that will definitely shave some time off of uh, answering questions. Hopefully that makes sense. The solubility table, I find, is something that um, tends, to, tends to take a few more reps to figure out. So get those reps in, and we'll talk about any questions that you might have. Thanks, guys.